Hasnos, lift off! Take my chances Racing time Rewriting the book For all to see On my own I can ride the winds of change To heal a broken time A broken Pierce the skies 
Okay, that's enough. Today, the Blackstone Railroad will set off on a new journey around our entire region. I hope the world will follow this example and start developing again. Wow, the mayor seems so dignified now. Yeah, you're right. Although we face a great many hardships ahead, I am certain that if we all work together, we will see them through safely. You, the great citizens of Palm Brinks, have weathered so many storms and coped with so much adversity that today's victory goes to you all. There was a time when our world was blanketed in darkness. The people of that time fought back and reclaimed their future. I'll take my but the story of their battle could never be passed down to future generations. Did this amazing adventure really happen or not? No one can say for sure. But if you could walk out into the night sky and speak to the moon, I'm certain it would tell you all about our strange adventure. I was so scared then, but in a way it was really fun. I mean, every boring day had been just the same for me. But this, this was the beginning of a real adventure. I'll take my chances.
about to embark on a wonderful adventure. Let me give you a few tips before you start. First off, let's talk about moving around. To walk, push the left analog stick a little. Push it all the way to run. The right analog stick controls the camera. You can turn the camera with the L1 and R1 buttons too, except in dungeons. When you're on the move, pressing the circle button or the L2 button brings the camera around behind your character. This is handy when you want to look in the direction your character is facing. When the fight's looking bad, all you can do is run. But when the enemy's too close, you can't run very fast, so you should try to get away as soon as you can. And when the enemy's nearby, you can't open treasure chests. So either drag the chest away from your enemy, or defeat your enemy first and then open it. In the dungeons, you can use items, even during a battle. But to do that, you need to set the item you want to use as an active item first. The item that you select will be displayed in the active item frame at the top left of the screen, even when you're moving around. Select the active item you want to use by pressing left and right on the directional button and press the square button to use it. Items which you can throw will be thrown as soon as you hit the square button. If you throw them once you're locked onto the enemy, you'll be fairly sure of a hit. There are loads of treasure chests scattered around the dungeons, so you're sure to come across a few. But be careful, cause some of them are booby-trapped. If you guess the kind of trap and disarm it, you'll be able to open the chest without anything happening. But if you fail to spot a trap, it'll get ya! There are also some treasure chests that are locked. If you have the treasure chest key, that won't be a problem. But if you don't have the key and you force a chest open, you run the risk of setting off a booby trap. Do you know what the red bit is above the monster's HP bar? It's called the rage counter, and each time you attack a monster, it decreases by one. If you don't defeat the monster before it runs out, the monster will go into rage mode. If that happens, the monster will get a lot stronger, so you'd better not attack it half-heartedly with a weak weapon. In a fight, you could be attacked by things like poison, which will put you in abnormal status. When you go into abnormal status, using normal recovery items like bread won't work. The only thing that will work for poison is the antidote drink. When you're in a particular abnormal status, you'll need the right item to let you recover. When fighting a monster that uses abnormal status attacks, you'd better get yourself the status recovery item before you go in guns a-blazing. I know enough about weapons not to have to ask anyone about them, but it can't hurt to review. Changing equipment takes place within the item menu, which is reached by choosing item from the command menu. Grab the item you want to equip with the square button. Place it above a character and press the square button again to complete the equipment change. If you press the X button on top of a weapon, you can select the equip command, which will then equip that weapon. You can change equipment for five separate locations, right hand weapon, left hand weapon, shoes, body, and head. If you defeat an enemy with a weapon, then their magic power will tumble out of them in the form of tiny blue grains. If you pick these up, then the weapon which delivered the final blow will absorb the magic from them. The parameter which shows how much a weapon has absorbed is the Magic Absorb Status, or ABS. 
The blue bar at the side of the weapon's icon represents its current ABS. If the ABS bar fills up, then the weapon goes up a level and its stats improve. This is called weapon growth. Weapons also have a stat called WHP, which displays the weapon's durability. This is the orange bar at the side of a weapon's icon. If this falls to zero, then the weapon breaks, and its attacks will no longer affect enemies. You can return a broken weapon to normal by repairing it, using Repair Powder. However, if a weapon gets broken, then its ABS will decrease slightly. So, if possible, it's better to fix a weapon before it breaks completely. What's more, some weapons need items other than repair powder to fix them. For instance, guns need gun repair powder and armbands need armband repair powder. So to fix the gun I got from Donnie, I don't need repair powder, but gun repair powder. An effective way to make a weapon stronger is to combine an item with it. If you move the cursor to a weapon on the item menu and press the X button, the weapon menu opens. Select status and information on the weapon is displayed. The synthesis points at the bottom of the status window display what kind of items this weapon can be combined with. As a weapon gains levels, its number of synthesis points increases. If you place the cursor over the item you want to combine next and press the X button, the commands for that item appear. Items which display the command Spectrumize can be combined with a weapon. Selecting Spectrumize breaks down the item and creates a synth sphere that contains the properties of that item. By taking the synth sphere, placing it over the weapon with which you wish to combine and pressing the X button, you can add the powers within it to those of the weapon. When you find a new, stronger weapon, you can use Spectrumize on your old weapon and then add its abilities to the new one. This is the key to making even stronger weapons faster. However, when turned into a synth sphere, a weapon's stats decrease somewhat. So, without a weapon with high stats to combine it with, the weapon can start out weaker than before. What's more, if you spectrumize with a weapon that is less than plus 5, it will become an unstable synth sphere and will hardly alter any stats when combined. Better be careful of that. Weapons have various attributes. You can check them by pressing the X button over a weapon and then selecting Status. The weapon's stats are shown as 10 attributes. Once each attribute goes over a set level, it is possible to evolve the weapon to a stronger one. Each weapon has a maximum limit to each attribute, so making stronger weapons is tough if you don't use Build Up to advance to a new weapon. Also, in addition to the 10 attributes, weapons can sometimes have other special abilities. The finer points of this are still a little unclear, so let's go over it more closely. As you raise each weapon and certain conditions are met, it can advance to the next weapon rank. This is called weapon buildup. If you build a weapon up, not only does its appearance change, but the limit on its parameters also increases, making it possible to aim for even higher stats. If you select the Build Up command, and then click on the question marks under Next Weapon, you can find out exactly which stats need to be improved in order to build up your weapon. Use this information to help you plan how best to raise up each weapon. Hey, Borneo here. I'll be explaining how to move around. To go to a different area, select Move from the main menu. You can ride on the train to the area you choose.
All you have to do is choose a place on the area map and leave the driving of the train to Cedric and me. If you use the move command in the dungeons, you can check the dungeon info. If you then press the square button, you can get out of the dungeons whenever you like. But if you escape before completing a floor, you'll lose half your money. But it's up to you. If you want to get out of the dungeons, the best way to do it is wait until you've completed a floor and then choose Leave Dungeons from the menu that appears. This way you won't be wasting your money. The conquest of a dungeon is not a thing to be rushed. Hey, Borneo here. I'll be explaining how to move around. To go to a different area, select Move from the main menu. You can ride on the train to the area you choose. All you have to do is choose a place on the area map and leave the driving of the train to Cedric and me. If you use the Move command in the dungeons, you can check the dungeon info. If you then press the square button, you can get out of the dungeons whenever you like. But if you escape before completing a floor, you'll lose half your money. But it's up to you. If you want to get out of the dungeons, the best way to do it is wait until you've completed a floor and then choose Leave Dungeons from the menu that appears. This way you won't be wasting your money. The conquest of a dungeon is not a thing to be rushed. Let me tell you about the Ride Pod. When you're up against a big tall baddie or facing a nasty opponent that isn't phased by normal attacks, that's when you call on the Ride Pod. To switch over, all you gotta do is go to the character menu and select the ride pod. The green bar on the status screen shows how much energy you got left, but be careful, cause when this hits zero, you won't be able to maneuver it in the dungeons anymore. By defeating an enemy with the ride pod, the core at the heart of the machine builds up experience points, or EXP. And by building up its EXP, you can upgrade the core and raise its capacity. The capacity tells you what parts the core can handle, and the higher the capacity, the better parts you can install. Once you start racking up the EXP, just let me know and I can upgrade your core for you. When you get a Monster Change Badge, you can transform into that monster. Use the main menu's character command to select a character, then Monster Transform. If you have a badge, you'll be taken to the Badge Select screen to select the monster you'd like to change into. You'll be able to speak with other monsters of your own kind. Who knows what secrets you'll uncover. You can't get badges that easily. You have to figure out a way to defeat the right monster first. In some situations, you must press the square button to bring up an item selection window. Choose the item that fits your needs in that particular situation. If you pick the right item, you get to continue with your adventure. If you don't have the item you need in inventory, press the circle button to cancel. Then you've got to go out and look for that item you need. Now I'm going to explain about using normal items. On the main menu, select Items. This brings you to the item window. Move the cursor to the item you want to use with the directional buttons or with the left analog stick. Then press the X button. A list of commands you can use on that item will appear. Just pick the command you want to perform. And that's how you use items. In the 
item window, using the square button to select an item lets you pick up that item. Once you've got a hold of it, you can move it somewhere else. Pressing the square button again drops the item into the place the cursor is pointing. Move things around any way you want to make them easier to use. You can move items with the triangle button too, but with the triangle button, you can control the amount of that item that you move. Finally, pressing the select button automatically organizes your items. Pressing the select button again sorts your items into different orders. Hey, I'm Donnie, and I'm going to explain the basic controls in the dungeons. The X button is for using the weapon in your right hand. If you press the X button while holding down the L1 button, you'll attack with the projectile weapon in your left hand. If you hold down the X button for a long time, when you release it, you'll do a charge attack. Use it at critical moments. Pressing the R1 button will defend you against the enemy's attack. And if you press the X button while holding down the R1 button, you can pick up a monster close to you and then throw him by pressing the X button again. Cool! In the same way, you can pick up and throw things like the big rocks that are in the dungeons. Try chucking them at the monsters! To advance to the next floor in the dungeons, you need the gate key item. One of the monsters will have the gate key hidden on him, so if you defeat him, you'll get the key. But, of course, you won't know if he has the key or not till you defeat him. And the gate key for each dungeon is a different item. Try not to get them mixed up. When exploring the dungeons, you can switch to the map view by pressing the select button. Pressing the button will switch between off, small display, and large display, so pick which one you want. You can also find floor maps and magic crystals down in the dungeons. With a floor map, you can see the whole layout of the floor you're on. A magic crystal will show you the positions of the monsters and treasure. The map view will be useful for finding both of them. The floor map and the magic crystal won't work anymore when you go to another floor, so you'll have to look for new ones. If you get near a monster and press the circle button when the marker is displayed, you'll go into lock-on mode, which means that wherever you move, you'll always turn to be facing your enemy head-on. Remember this, it'll make it a lot easier to fight. If you want to change the target you've locked on, tap the circle button. Each time you tap it, you'll lock on to a different monster nearby. When you're locked on, moving the left analog stick away from your target and pressing the X button will make you evade to avoid the monster's attack. This is another cool move, so don't forget it. And finally, here's how to get out of the lock-on mode. Move the left analog stick away from your target and press the circle button. That'll do it. Defeat enemies while changed into a monster, and the badge's skill level will increase. When the experience bar is full, the badge's level goes up. At a certain point, you'll be able to change into the next grade of monster. Plus, when you've reached the master level, you'll get a reward item from the badge. The reward depends on the badge.
Inventing starts with collecting ideas, and all you need to do to collect ideas is to take pictures with a camera. If you press the square button with your camera set to the active item, the screen will switch over to the viewfinder. Move the viewfinder with the left analog stick and press the square button again to take the picture. On the viewfinder screen, you can view all the pictures you've taken so far with the triangle button. To find out if the pictures can be used for an invention, just look for little light bulb marks next to the picture's name. That's how you know what you can use. Now here's something to keep in mind about the camera. In non-dungeon areas, the camera can be set anywhere you like. But when you're in the dungeons, if the camera isn't set to an active item and the marker isn't on the camera, you won't be able to use it. Don't forget, all right? When you get everything together, then comes the actual inventing. You can do this from the Make command on the main menu. The invention cards will be lined up on the left. Now, in order to invent something, select New Invention at the very top, and then choose the three items you want to use. If the items are matched up correctly, your invention is a success. The item you invent will be registered as a card. Just remember, just cause you get this far, it doesn't mean you're finished. No siree. All you'll have at this stage are plans for actually making the invention. So next, I'll tell you how to actually make your new gadget. Select the invention card for your new item from the Make menu. Decide how many you want to make by pressing left or right on the directional button, and finish up by selecting yes with the directional button. If you don't have enough supplies to create your item, you can pick them up at a shop or some other place. So you think you got that down? Well, go on and make new items to your heart's content. Max, changing the ravaged world back to normal is a pretty hefty job. You have to move people from Palm Brinks all around in order to help the world of the future grow. To move people, first you gotta get them on the train as part of your party, and then take them with you on your journey. Everyone has their own problems, son, so if you can help them out first, I'm sure they'll join us in our quest to bring the world back to life. You can even take the people from the train into the dungeons with you to help you fight monsters. If you talk to them inside the train and choose Add to Party, you can make them a third party member. Now, the third party member won't actually be able to fight, but they sure can back you up with their different support abilities. Choose your third party member from the character part of the main menu. On the support character screen, you can choose the ability you want them to use. Using the third party member's ability to your advantage can really help you fight your way through the dungeons. The further you get into dungeons, the more dangerous it gets. Depending on the situation, Max, sometimes it's better for me to take over the fighting. In situations like that, choose me from Characters on the main menu. With my sword and my magic, I can take on even the toughest monsters. Sometimes there's more than one exit to a dungeon. When there's more than one, you'll see an emblem on each exit. Find the emblems of the exit routes you haven't tried yet on the Dungeon Tree map using the Move command to view. That way, you can be sure to try all the exits. Hey there, do you fish? I'm going to tell you how it's done. You can fish in two different places, on the normal map and in dungeons. First, you gotta equip a fishing rod. Just use the item menu, like you would for a weapon. Then you bait the hook. You're not gonna catch a thing if you don't have any bait on there. With the rod equipped in your right hand, select your bait with the X button and choose Put on Fishing Hook from the item commands. 
When you want to switch bait, select the new bait in the same way to automatically replace the old stuff. Now you're ready to fish. Walk along the water and find a good spot. A prime location is key. After you've settled on a place to fish, press the X button to confirm your choice. Use the left analog stick to move the cursor and select your casting spot. Press the X button again to confirm the casting spot. That's where you're going to cast your hook. Now you have to watch the bobber. If the bobber sinks into the water, quickly pull the left analog stick down toward you. If your timing's good, you'll catch a fish. Now you've got one on the line! Keep pressing the X button to reel it in! Now pay attention to the bar on screen. This shows the current tension of your fishing line. If it goes too far, the line will snap and your catch is history. Adjust your reel timing so the tension bar doesn't get too high. Get your fish onto the banks and it's yours to keep! The rules are the same inside a dungeon, but you gotta kill off all the enemies first. You'll catch different fish depending on the place, the time and your bait, so keep trying. Fishing is a deep sport. Enjoy! Oh ho! Looks like you found a lure! Let me tell you how to fish with one of those! First you put the lure on the rod, just like you do with regular bait. Choose Put on Fishing Hook from the lure commands and you're good! Just like bobber fishing, pick a choice location. Then you gotta choose your casting point with the left analog stick. When you've decided, press the X button to cast. Use the left analog stick to move the rod when the lure hits the water and the X button to reel it in. Lure fishing relies on rod movement and line reeling to attract fish. Try a lot of different combinations. When you've pulled the lure all the way in, cast it out again. Repeat as necessary. If a fish approaches as you're reeling in your line, your hands will feel it bump against you. Quickly pull the stick toward you. If your timing's good, you'll hook the fish. If you can't feel it, use the mark on the lure's head to judge when to pull it in. Now that you've got one, keep pressing the X button to reel it in. Watch the line tension. Lure fishing is challenging, so make sure you get some practice in. Hey Max, it's Need here. How you doing? I've decided to hold a fishing contest from time to time in Palm Brinks. During a fishing contest, if you catch a big fish, bring it to the weighing tent which you'll find in the Palm Brinks Town Square. But bear in mind that fish you've been feeding and keeping as pets don't count. While we're weighing fish for the contest, the message Fishing Contest will appear on the main menu screen. You can weigh up to ten fish in each contest and you'll get points for the best three. If you win, you'll be honored with a prize. If you weigh in three or more fish and go to the race master after the race and select total up, your top three fish will be totaled and the race results displayed. There are loads of great prizes to be won, so go forward and catch a whopper. The world has been driven crazy by Emperor Griffin, who everyone calls the Dark Ruler. This has caused a lot of peculiarities. Svita is a sport which makes use of these peculiarities. All over the world there are holes in time called time distortions. Fragments of time called spheres have been knocked out of the time distortions. In order to block the holes you need to put the spheres back in. You can't touch the spheres so you'll need to use a Svita rod to aim at the time distortion and then take a shot.
The spheres and the distortions can be red or blue. Red ones repel each other and blue ones repel each other, so if a sphere hits a distortion of the same color, it won't go in. If a sphere hits the floor or a wall, it changes color. Use your skill to change a sphere to the right color before aiming for a distortion. When a sphere goes into a distortion, the distortion will disappear and the treasure inside will come out. Collecting treasure is well and good, but the main goal is to eliminate as many distortions as possible to help with the world right. Howdy there! Putting our magnum opus Carpentarian into good use, are ya? Alrighty then, why don't I just explain how you use Carpentarian to build up your towns? By pressing the select button in areas where you can build towns, you can switch over to the Carpentarian control mode. It'll switch to an aerial view, so you'll be able to tell you're there. If you press the triangle button in this mode, you can access the Georama menu. Now then, here's how you go about building stuff. There are tons of things you can do, so it's best to play around and learn as you go. First, you have to build your Georama parts before you can place anything on the ground. Once you have the necessary materials, Make the parts with the make command. Then, with the place command, choose where on the ground to put stuff. Before you start, you'll have to collect geostones. Stones filled with the wisdom of the ancients. They're scattered all over the dungeons. Then, put them into the Carpentarian's reactor, and you can build up your library of available parts. Well, we'll be the ones actually putting the geostones into the reactor. All you gotta do is go and find them. Okay, now I'll tell you how exactly to go about placing your parts on the map. Choose place, and then choose your part, and then you'll arrive at the placement screen. Decide the spot you want to put it with the left analog stick and rotate the part with the L2 and R2 buttons to choose the angle you want to place it in. When you've found a good spot and angle for it, just press the X button to set the part down there. Depending on the part, you can stack them or attach them to the rows of houses and so on. Just have fun and experiment with it. For lamps and items that attach to the sides of walls, first take the part to the top of the building and then press the X button. Then attach it to the building and choose the wall with the L2 and R2 buttons and decide its position on the wall with the left analog stick. All these steps might be a little confusing, but I'm sure you'll get the hang of it in no time, lad. Now, Max. Let me tell you how to populate these areas you'll be restoring from here on out. In order to move people, first you have to have people on the train with you, see? If there's no one on board, just go back to your own town and find some people to recruit. So, when you have people with you, you press the X button in front of the door of one of your new houses to select whether to go inside or to move people there. Here, you select Move People In, and next, you choose the person you want to move from among the people inside the train. Once you do this, they'll start a new life in their brand new home. We need people for the world of the future to grow, right? So don't be lazy about gathering people now. Once you've reworked the land and started your town, you should try taking the red time gate to the future. If you fulfilled all the conditions, the future should be developing differently than it was before. When you want to come back to the present, just jump through the blue time gate. The things you'll get by helping the future develop will in turn help you solve the problems of the present. And again, that will have an effect on the future as well. If you try hard and keep this up, I know you'll be able to restore the future to its true form, lad.
What's this? Don't understand how to develop the future, you say? Okay, okay. There's a command called analysis on the Georama menu, so just select that. You should be able to find the conditions for developing the future written out there. Future developments are written on large lamps on the left. If you fulfill all the conditions for that development, the lamp will light up. For each lamp you light up, something in the future will be changed. You just keep working at it. Help develop the future. Conditions, marked with question marks, will open up as you obtain more geostones. So, if you get stuck, just go explore deeper into the dungeons. You can check your total progress at the complete section of the Georama analysis. You can still move forward, even if you're not at 100%. But there's a surprise waiting for you if you get all the way to 100%. So you might want to try and find out what that is, eh? Among the conditions for developing the Georama is one that requires you to obtain at least a certain number of culture points, or CP. The culture points shows the level of the culture in that area. You can check the culture points with Culture on the Georama menu. To raise your culture points, the best thing to do is to build more buildings, but just building them won't get you that far. To milk more points out of the buildings, try doing different stuff, like adding chimneys and lamps. You know, make it nice and fancy. For example, rather than building two houses, you might be able to get more culture points out of one house with a lamp and a chimney, you know. Hey, great timing! I've decided to hold a new event, the Finny Frenzy. Contestants make their fish race each other. I've got a lot of major prizes up my sleeve, so make sure you take part. While the fish race is being held, the message Finny Frenzy will appear on the main menu, so bring along the fish you want to participate when you see it. Obviously, it all takes place in Palm Brink's town square. Seeing as you're a novice fish racer, let me give you a few pointers on how to raise the fish. Naturally, you'll need an aquarium. Put fish you catch into the aquarium, which you'll find on the item screen. Use the aquarium command to see the fish that you've already put in. There are three tanks for training your fish. The first tank is the wreck tank. This is where your fish usually live and eat. How strong they get depends on the type of food you give them, so choose wisely. The second tank is the battle tank. It's for improving your fish's toughness for when they collide during a race. If you put two or more fish into this tank, they'll fight each other and improve their skills. So there's no point in just having one fish in there. One thing, if you don't remove a fish before its HP runs out, it'll die. So watch out. And now for the last of the three tanks. This third tank is the breeding tank. You can combine two different fish to make stronger fish. There's no point in just having one fish in this tank either. As time passes, and if the breeding is successful, the two breeding fish will die, but in their place, two new fish will be born. Even though the two new fish inherit their parents' abilities, if the parents weren't strong, then their children won't be either, so bear this in mind. It can take a long time to improve your fish's skills in the battle tank and achieve success in the breeding tank. If you want to spend all your time watching the fish, that's fine but it's probably better to take care of other things at the same time. Time will pass just as real time does, so you just need to keep an eye on the fish every now and then. Right, now I'll tell you how to enter the Finny Frenzy. Go to the tent in Palm Brinks Town Square and speak to the race master if you want to take part. You can enter three races at a time. It's up to you whether you enter the same fish three times or a different fish for each race. 
Fish get tired, so entering the same fish for three races isn't such a good idea. If you leave the tent before all three races are completed, that will be the end of the whole fish racing competition. So remain in the tent for the duration of the entire competition. Okay, so you've told the race master you want to participate. Now you have to choose the fish you're entering from the aquarium. At this stage, you can only choose a fish from the wreck tank. Then you must choose the class you want to enter. Try to choose the most appropriate class to match your fish's level. Lastly, choose the tank you would like to use to make your final pre-race preparations. Think carefully about the fish's character, as the tank that you choose will have an effect on their performance. After all that, the race will start. Now all you can do is watch. Keep a close eye on the race and root hard for your fish to win. There are some great prizes to be won, so go for it. Raise a champion. The road to adventure is long and perilous. When you want to take a break in your adventuring, be sure to record the progress you've made so far. Here and there along your travels, you'll find a mysterious glowing book. Approaching this book and pressing the X button will bring you to a screen where you can record your adventure's progress. The next time you play, you can pick up your adventure where you left off. Always remember to record your progress. Don't let any of your hard adventuring go to waste.